Well, we have a drawer in our house. Um, you might have one, too. This is the way ours look. No uh, Photoshop. Um, I took this the other morning. Um, this is actually just one layer of our drawer. You can actually pick this top layer off, and there's a whole other layer below. Now, this drawer has a name in our house, and I don't know what you call yours. We call it the junk drawer. Um, and it's a weird name because it's really not a drawer filled with junk. It's just drawer. <laughs> Maybe should we should call it the miscellaneous drawer instead of the junk drawer. I know that's too, that's too many syllables, hard to say. So we call it the junk drawer, but it's not junk. It's just things like there's, I, I was looking through ours kind of inventory. There's like that little light bulb for the refrigerator ice dispenser that, you know, like I'll put one in there and we'll have it next time. And there was things like, I, I remember seeing there was Q-tips in there, but they were for the cat. You know, like we don't want to mix those up. I don't know why. It's not like they're used Q-tips, but it seems gross to use the cat's Q-tips. And you're wondering what we do to our cat. Don't worry. Anyway, anyway, there's all sorts of things in there. There's like the tiny little glasses screwdrivers that you work on your eyeglasses with. I found like a couple batteries in there and I was like, is this for the alarm system or that digital camera we haven't had in 10 years? You know, it's so weird, like you just leave it in there because you think I might need that. And so it's sort of the miscellaneous drawer, but it's also, I guess I could call it the drawer of a thousand glues because there's like, seriously, like every kind of glue in the world in there and half of them are dried up and so you put another one in there and there's like seven types of super glues and wood glue and paper glue and then there's that new, oh, I'm so excited about this because I fix everything in our house, that new kind of plastic with the UV light that cures it, the plastic weld fixes anything. It doesn't fix anything. I found that. But there are certain things it fixes really well. It's like magic. And my family, like, they don't believe in me in many ways for obvious reasons, but they do believe that I can fix anything. You know, like, they'll bust a snow globe and go, here, glue it back together. Like, I don't know what to do. But anyway, like, so we've got a thousand different kinds of glues in there. And it's also, our drawer is also sort of the place, I guess we would call it the... I don't know what it is, but it looks important drawer. Do you have that? Like where, I'll give you an example. There was the recliner incident of 1998. My wife found this, like this bolt. It was actually more of like a machine screw with an eccentric washer on it in the middle of our living room floor. And of course she said, did this fall out of your pocket? Because I always stick random things in my pocket at work and I'm on the job site. <laughs> but I said, no, I don't know what it is. So it laid on our counter for like, I don't, I don't know, like three or four weeks. And then one day she got tired of it and threw it away. And then the next time we went to open a recliner in our love seat that we never do, like it just shot across the room and it like, <laughs> Uh, and, and literally had to replace that whole thing because we couldn't find that one weird bolt and the weird eccentric one. So it's like now when you find that weird adapter or something, you go, don't throw it away, put it in the junk drawer. And so it's just that type of drawer. And the reason why I tell you all that this morning, like, happy Easter, by the way, um, not just, I, I really think if our brains had a junk drawer, Easter would be in it, right? Like, because Easter is hard to sort of categorize. You know, hey, someone died for you. Where are you going to put that in your week? You know, and hey, he's alive. He was dead. I mean, that's not a normal thing to talk about. And so I think most of us, if we were honest, even if you're a church person, even if you're a God person, like where you sort of file Easter in your week. Um, I don't know where I would file Easter in my week. My last week was crazy. And it's like, and Sunday I'm talking to you. But here's the, here's the thing. Um, part of that is because Easter is sort of a strange holiday, if we're just being honest. Like, um, it's the only holiday that moves by like a month. What if Christmas was like that? Oh, by the way, Christmas is like October 7th. Pass it on. You know, it's just weird. Like, here we are in March. Last year it was like the end of April. Um, and also, Easter is weird because of how churches celebrate it. And I know that we're the weirdest church of all. I fully admit that. But if you're a church person, now if you're not, we have all different kinds of people. Maybe you have no church background. And we'll talk about your sort of background with Easter. But if you're a church person like I am, um, you grew up celebrating Easter. But the funny thing is here at Action Church, we have all different kinds of church backgrounds. And churches are weird because Easter is celebrated somewhere like between a funeral and winning Mario Kart. Think about this, like seriously. Like I have been to church services with my friends that were super, super formal and well put together, unlike anything we would ever do. But like, and there's like flowers and organ music and like mournful poems. And you're like, they're going, he is alive. And you're going, but he sounds like he's dead. I mean, 
mean, I've been to a funeral, and they're like, but we're celebrating his life. And you're like, that's what you always say at a funeral. So sometimes Easter feels like a funeral. Maybe that's your background. And other churches, like, I was raised Southern Baptist, so we just sort of read King James and stared at each other and said, by the way, we don't dance because of Jesus, and I don't know what that was about. But anyway, more of due to Footloose, I think. But here's the thing, like, some churches, I went to a Pentecostal friend church, and it was like winning Mario Kart. Like, like I'm seriously, it was crazy because, like, they're like, Jesus is alive, and confetti's coming her down, and Donkey Kong spinning around, there's bananas flying. I don't know what happened. It was crazy. But there's a real wide difference in that. And then, like, everybody else's Easter, they're like, oh, you guys are weird. Like, we eat ham. You know, that was pretty much, you know, and we have candy. That's what we do for Easter. And so Easter is weird, and it's hard to categorize. Um, and so I know, like, this morning, I just want to talk to you really quickly about, like, what to do with this whole Easter thing. You know, I said Happy Easter. Actually, I said Merry Easter half the time because I'm stupid, but, like, and I'm awkward. You know, like, Happy Easter. Like, what? what is that about? Like, Jesus died. Happy Easter. You know, Jesus is alive, though. Happy Easter. But he's gone. Happy Easter. And, you, and it's just strange. And I understand, like, we're all from different backgrounds. And, and if you're here this morning and you're like, I'm here because I heard there was, like, candy. And, I don't know, somebody tricked me into their car this morning. You know, whatever. Like, we're glad you're here, even if you're sort of, like, cynical and going, I don't even believe that Jesus lived. I get that. I get that. And you're so welcome here at Action Church. In fact, I want to just say up front, this is really not going to be about trying to prove that Jesus actually rose from the grave this morning because I've realized one thing in my life that is that is so interesting. Like, um, sort of the more video we have, the more I realize that it would be impossible to actually prove to anyone that Jesus is alive. I mean, I mean, think about that. Like, it's so funny. I heard a great story about somebody's kid who said they were watching Ten Commandments. Um, you know, the the old Charlton Heston that I always get mixed up with Planet of the Apes for some reason. But they were watching that last night, and they actually said, "Did they reenact this, or did they have cameras there by accident?" And I was like. <laughs> That's, no, seriously, like, that's a good question. Like, we live in a world, and it looks that old. <laughs> you filthy apes, I don't know. But anyway, like, I make that joke every Easter. It never works, but I can't stop because someday I'm putting that over. But anyway, like, it's weird because our kids think that everything's video, but we still don't believe anything, right? Have you noticed that? Like, we have video of stuff, and people go, I bet that's staged, or I'd like to see another angle. You know, I'd believe it if there was, like, three different angles, but one angle, no. So we can't prove, I know that I can't prove to you, like, Jesus rose from the dead. I do want to give you, like, if you are, if you do sort of struggle with that, and you go, hey, I'm not sure, I'm going to give you the three reasons why I actually believe it. And they're not proof. They're just sort of why a construction worker like I am, I'm a painting contractor in real life, um, who works on a job site and I'm pretty cynical about things. Here's why I believe he rose and you know, your mileage may vary. I just want to tell you why I believe. Um, number, number one is the number and the type of witnesses. Um, I would be really skeptical of this story, just being honest, if it was like one guy saw Jesus alive and he's like, hey, you know, you should buy my special juice and you'll see him too. You know, if there was some sort of prophet motive or, but, but that's not what happened. What we read in scripture is that hundreds and hundreds of people saw Jesus. And the funny thing is they really had no motive to say that he was alive because they were actually punished and killed for saying that because the powerful people of that time, both the Romans and the Jews, were trying to stomp out this cult of Christianity before it got started. That's why they killed Jesus. So actually, people risked their lives to go, I saw him, or my friend saw him, and I believe him. He wouldn't lie. It was ba So it's an odd thing, like, why would that even spread? And, and it wasn't like Jesus just appeared to one or two people. Another thing that I, really makes me believe Jesus is alive is because of his brothers. Jesus had two brothers, and actually multiple brothers and sisters, born to Mary and Joseph after he was born. And one of them was named James, and one of them was named Jude that we know of. And the interesting thing is they're not mentioned following him at all while he's alive. Literally, in his ministry, the only notice that we have of his family and it's pretty funny because it's actually what my family would do. Like, there's one scripture that sort of mentions his brothers and his mother coming, going, hey, dude, um... 
maybe you should come home. <laughs> you know, they were just like, like your family doesn't think you could do anything important. They didn't believe in Jesus either. They're kind of like, hey, uh, kind of make it a spectacle of yourself here, carpenter boy. Why don't you come on home and we'll talk about that. And he said, these are not my brothers and sisters. And it was like really crazy. That's the only mention we have. And yet after Jesus rises from the grave and sort of goes back to heaven, we find them starting these letters that they're writing because they're actually followers of Jesus. They're leading this movement and they're saying stuff. Imagine, this is his brother saying, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean he's saying a slave of Jesus Christ. This letter is from Jude, also his brother. A slave of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. He never even says, and I'm the brother of Jesus because they didn't feel like they had the same father because God was Jesus' father. I mean, Andy Stanley says this so well. He always says, like, what would it take for you to believe your brother or sister was the son of God? It would take something like rising from the dead. And so I think that's good evidence because I've got six brothers and sisters, and they still don't believe that I'm doing this. They like, <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> I also think the reason why, uh, for good reason, as you'll see later, but um, just the mere existence, and this is my final sort of reason why I believe that Jesus is alive, is the existence of Christianity is so weird because the message of the church, like now you could go, well, the message of church is be nice or follow the teachings of Jesus. Or there's actually, it's kind of interesting that this movement we call Christianity, a lot of times they just talk about Paul, you know, like hardly mention the gospels in some settings. But, but the whole message of the first church was basically Jesus was the Messiah, you killed him, he's alive, I've seen him, say you're sorry. Like, that's all they preached. If you read the book of Acts and you actually read the, the uh, Gospels and the Epistles where they're pre or not the Gospels, but the Epistles where they're actually talking about what they preached, the whole basis of this movement of Christianity was based on the fact that Jesus was alive and you should say you're sorry. So it wasn't based on his teachings, not on his ideas, it was on he was alive. So it should have not worked at all. Honestly, if Jesus wasn't alive, if people didn't believe that, we shouldn't be talking 2,000 years later. But I know that that's all I'm going to say about that because those are just my reasons I believe. But what should we do about Easter? Like, whether you believe, maybe if you've believed all your life, like, I, I believe Jesus is the risen Son of God. I believe he went, all, you believe all the things the Bible says. What do you do with Easter still? You know, what do you do? I mean, I know it's just a day to celebrate, but what does it matter that that is true? Um, now, what I want to talk to you about this morning, which is a little different than what I've ever done, but let's just all sort of agree that, you know, you've been to Easter services before, and if you haven't, you're not missing anything, that, you know, Jesus was found and the tomb was empty and Mary came. And, and all the things we read every year, like the tomb is empty, that's great, and I talk about them every year, but this year I'm not really going to talk about it. Let's just agree that that happened, or you can be skeptical, and go, I'm not sure that happened, but we're here to celebrate Easter a couple thousand years later, and so let's just sort of gather on that point. But I want to read to you this morning a a piece of a chapter of what happened directly before Easter. And the reason why I want to do that um, is because I realize that Jesus sort of lays out why his death, burial, and resurrection was important. And I think that's so powerful, and I think that's interesting to us because, I mean, you could hear what I think about it, and it's really not that useful. What did Jesus say about it? And this, this scripture sort of, there's two references to this in two different gospels. The, the writer of Luke was a physician who went back and he said, hey, I want to sort of compile all the things that we know about Jesus in a book. That's where the story of Luke came from, and he talked to eyewitnesses. A lot of the information we believe came from the apostle Peter, who was with Jesus the whole time. And then also Matthew, who was a tax collector, who was this hated sinner guy, and Jesus said, come follow me, became a huge follower of Jesus and, and one of the 12 disciples. He wrote about this, this sort of this week, these stories as well. So there's two different confirmations that this happened. Now, what was happening this week is if we were a better church, last week would have been Palm Sunday. <laughs> uh, but it, Palm Sunday is about roughly, and I shouldn't be talking about a week later, but Palm Sunday is the week where we celebrate the fact that Jesus came into Jerusalem and they like waved palm fronds and said, you're the king, and like laid their coats down. So he, I mean, I mean, literally treated him like a king. And then the next week they killed him. So, but that's what Palm Sunday is all about. So that had just happened. Um, I think we did better because we learned about purpose last week and Dave did a fantastic job of it. But anyway... That had already happened. Jesus had already went into the same week. So imagine this week 
before he's crucified. He has been welcomed into Jerusalem like a king. He went into the temple. Imagine this. And a lot of you think of Jesus as like some sort of like feathered hair guy who drives a Prius, you know, like that, you know, carries a lamb all the time inexplicably, you know, just like why, I don't know, but he looks like that. No, I mean, he, he was, I want to call him something, but I'm not. But like, he, he was amazing because he went into their temple, their giant temple, and it's not a church. We think of a church like this was a 20 acre plot of ground dedicated to God, and it's this enormous building. And he saw merchants there, and he saw people sort of swindling the people uh, that came to worship. And he threw, he made a whip out of cords. You talk about a tough guy, turned over their tables and threw them out of the temple. So that sort of made a few enemies, as you can imagine. He also, just sort of a side thing, he was hungry one day and he saw a fig tree and he's like, oh, there's no figs and he cursed it and it died immediately. So he was doing all these miracles. He had just healed his friend Lazarus who had been dead for four days. So all of these amazing miracles could, had happened. So just to set that story up, why the people um, in power were concerned about Jesus and here's what happened. Matthew 21, 23 says, when Jesus returned to the temple and began teaching, this is after he had thrown everyone else out, the leading priests and the elders came up to him and they demanded, listen to this question because it's important, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Now, this is interesting because they weren't going, hey, we've heard you were doing something. No, everybody knew that Jesus was in town. Everyone knew that he was changing. Everybody knew he was turning the world upside down. That's what they said. You're turning the world upside down. And what they wanted to know is not, what are you doing? Everyone knew what Jesus was doing. They wanted to know, who gave you the right to do this? Who are you, basically? So Jesus is amazingly shrewd in this situation because he says, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question. And Jesus replied, did, God, did John's authority, this is John the Baptist, his cousin who sort of went before him and was also a huge figure, They'd, he'd already been killed. He was so popular and powerful, actually he was killed by the, by the King Herod for speaking out against his divorce. Um, does, does John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? And they talked it over among themselves Here's the predicament these leaders were in. They said, if we say it was from heaven, he will ask us why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, we'll be mobbed because the people believe John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these. So, so this sets up sort of the conflict. And Jesus was so shrewd, he like stumped all the leaders. So they're really angry. So what is Jesus going to do? So you imagine like Jesus is there. They've come out and they've like, who told you you could do this? He's sort of make them, made them look like idiots. And then Jesus starts to tell stories. Now here's the interesting thing about Jesus telling stories. There's so many like instances of these parables or stories that Jesus told. And they're not true stories. They're stories he made up that he actually like conceived in his mind. But the interesting thing I think about these stories as we read them, does it ever strike you that this is over 2,000 years ago and none of them um, are sort of out of date or just don't work anymore? Because there's so many things like you talk about like, hey, I remember I was at my friend's house. You know, you know like call waiting would have solved your whole story that you just told. But all of Jesus' stories still work. They are just so brilliant. They use human nature in such a way that you go, yeah, that could happen in 2016. I mean, it's just amazing. So let me read this simple story that Jesus told that really made the leaders angry. He said, but what do you think about this? So he's just preaching to this huge crowd, and these leaders who have come out and challenged him are standing right there, and he says to them, what do you think about this? A man had two sons, and he told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. And the son answered, <laughs> No, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. And then the father told the older son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will, but he didn't go. And then he asked the question, like, and, and think about that, that could still happen today, right? Like one kid says no, but they actually follow through, and the other kid's super, super respectful, yes, sir, Mr. Sir, and then doesn't do it. Um, he said, which of the two obeyed his father? And they replied, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? He's saying like, there were people doing completely the wrong thing, but when they heard the right thing, when John said, repent, turn from your sins and be baptized, they did it. They're going to be in heaven and you're not, even though you think you're right. Oh, wow. That is, he's like, you're super respectful, but you are sinful and wrong. And they were not happy, as you can imagine. Now, you would think Jesus would stop there. 
Well, this might be why he got killed. I mean, it's pretty, pretty clear right now about why they crucified him. They really hated him. He tells another story. And this is where I, I, I want to just kind of drill down into this story because it tells us a lot about what it means that he was crucified and killed. I mean, we can see why. And also, like, what he was trying to accomplish and what God was trying to accomplish. And so kind of from the words of Jesus, this is amazing. It says, now listen to another story. A certain landowner planted a vineyard, and he's talking, I mean, we can understand that we don't have necessarily a lot of vineyards around here, but it still works, like a farm. And he says he built a wall around it, and he put infrastructure in. We might say he had a barn, or he had a combine, or whatever. We're not necessarily farmers or vineyard owners. But he was saying things that are just still clear, like he improved the property, he got it ready for business, he built a lookout tower, and then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. So owns the property, leases the property, improves it, it's his, and he he says, you guys work here for a share of the crop. And at the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share. So he's like, I just want my rightful share. I mean, I built this. I let you use it. And your work is being rewarded with your pay. And they said, no. And the farmers grabbed his servants, and they beat one, and they killed one, and they stoned another. And so the landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him. But the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son thinking, surely, surely they'll respect my son. I mean, they're not going to kill him. They're not going to rough him up. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, and they dragged him out of the vineyard, and they murdered him. And then he asked this question to this group of leaders in front of this huge crowd. He says, when the owner of the vineyard returns, what do you think he'll do? to those farmers. See, here's, here's the really amazing thing looking back, and I'm so glad this was recorded. In this tense moment where it just had to be just silent, like Jesus knew, and the Bible says that they were actually already plotting to kill him. They were just sort of waiting for the day they could get the crowds away from him because they were scared of the crowds, but they needed Jesus gone. Um, and in fact, kind of the references to the farmer sending, you know, the landowner sending other servants, Jesus was actually making reference to the fact that Jerusalem was known for killing prophets. Like God would send a prophet and go, hey, here's what I want you to do. And they would stone them, kill them. In fact, we talked about Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah, just a few weeks ago, how they put him in a pit for a year. He was just sinking in the mud. And in fact, we find in Luke 13, Jesus crying, looking down at the city of Jerusalem, going, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. This had happened before. And so in hindsight, we can look back and go, yeah, here's the Son of God talking to the people who are going together together and murder him, and a crowd, honestly, who is not innocent because they're going to somehow be you know, swayed to go crucify him in just a short period, just in a matter of days. And the question is like, well, what do you think the landowner is going to do? What do you think God's going to do to the people who kill his son? And listen to what the religious leaders say. They convicted themselves. He said he'll put a wicked... The religious leaders replied, he will put the wicked men to a horrible death and at least the vineyards to others who give him a share of the crop after each harvest, who pay him the proper due. And Jesus asked them, didn't you ever read this in Scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the new cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. And anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken into pieces, and it will be crushed by anyone who falls on. And when the leading priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was telling the story against them, and that they were the wicked farmers in the story, and they wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds because the crowds considered Jesus to be prophet. Isn't that an amazing story? I'm so glad this recorded. Like, he's saying this right to your face. Like, I know what you're up to. And then he asks them the questions like, what would God do to, you know, what would this farmer do? And they had to say, oh, well, this farmer's going to come back with an army and just destroy these people. But notice, like, that's not what happened. That Jesus actually came not for revenge but for reconciliation, isn't it amazing, like, knowing this story and knowing the story that he told, like, just 
you and I, and they said the same thing, even though they realized they'd sort of convicted themselves, like, if Jesus comes back to life, if we kill the Son of God and he comes back from the dead, oh, he's going to be a little angry. You know, like, it makes sense that Jesus would come out of the tomb and just start, like, it, it would turn into a Avengers movie if we did this correctly, like, right? Like, he comes out of the tomb, he's alive, he's had three days to think about it, and now this time it's serious. I mean, like, you can imagine, and that's, but it's amazing that's not what happened. In fact, the whole story is that God, who plays the part of, in the story of the farmer who owns everything, and yes, the Christian worldview is not that, hey, you know, like some people go, oh, we should take care of the land, and Christians think you should just destroy it. No, Christians should believe God owns it. We don't own anything. It's all God's. He created it. And this story says that God sent his son not to sort of get back at them, not take what is due, but to reconcile with them. And so here's the point to the story I want you to notice. Like, by their own admission, they didn't get what they deserved, right? Like, they said, hey, that's the way the story should end, you know? That they killed the son, and God or the farmer destroyed them all. Um, now, we can also notice that Jesus was right about a couple things, because he said, um, <laughs> he said, you know, by the way, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you if you don't believe in me. That's basically what he's saying. Like, isn't it interesting that these religious leaders, these rulers who are so important in their time, are just a footnote in the story of Jesus today? Um, but I want you to notice something else. And this is sort of obscure and weird and sort of comes from the junk drawer of Scripture in a sense. He, he quoted a verse, and I looked this this scripture up that Jesus quoted, because what he actually quoted was Psalm 118. The, the, the scripture that he's quoting is like, haven't you ever read this? Which was super, super, super annoying to guys who spent their whole life memorizing scripture. And here's this carpenter's son going, hey, by the way, have you ever read this? I bet you didn't know this. But anyway, he said, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, here's what this came from, and I'm going to tell you the story that they knew. They would have known this story um, because this was a rabbinical parable that was told a lot, meaning their rabbis would tell this parable. They would tell this story, and this is kind of what this, this psalm is based on, or it came from the psalm, not sure which. It's not necessarily a true story, but it is a parable that they told. They said that when Solomon's temple, the temple, was created, and we know this from Scripture, it was amazing how they built it. Like, I mean, you should do like a, a history channel week on it, because they actually cut the stones in a quarry with, you know, hand labor, moved them to the site, and it said no sound of like an axe or a hammer was heard, because they actually fitted them together, they were so perfectly designed. Now, the story is that one day they got a shipment of this stone, like all the other stones fit perfectly, and, you know, like you could see, well, that one goes there, this is the next stone, and it didn't fit anywhere. In fact, it was a weird-shaped stone, and it says that uh, the, 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 the legend goes that they tossed it aside, sort of put it on the, on the heap, you know, like this, this, is a, this is a mistake, we got to talk to the guys at the quarry, but when they got to the end of sort of their build, and, and if you've seen like arches build in the past, they would have like scaffolding up, and when you get to the top, there was a thing called a capstone, which is, we're called the Keystone State, which really didn't work for me, because it looks nothing like a Keystone, but anyway, Pennsylvania is the Keystone State, imagine that top, that capstone of the arch, that was what that discarded stone was, and they had to kind of go in the junk drawer and get this massive stone out and go, oh, well, that's what that for. That fits perfectly. And the rabbis would tell that story and basically say from that story, like, God has a plan you don't see. And sometimes we sort of toss things aside and go, well, this doesn't fit. And it turns out it's the most important thing at all. And that's the story that this psalm related to. And that's what Jesus was sort of shoving in their face, going, see, you, you think you can get rid of me. You think that you understand exactly what's going on, but you have no clue. And that's true, isn't it, right? Looking back, you go, okay, those guys, those, those, those powerful men who thought they would stop this Jesus problem by killing Jesus, oh, my, they were wrong. Like, they're the footnote of the most amazing story that ever happened, that people gather in like a converted nightclub 2,000 plus years later and go, hey, let's talk about what happened back then. And it's not like we're going, and those guys were really smart for getting rid of Jesus. But they're like, no, that was just the beginning of the story. 
And think about this, think about this. The Roman leaders and the Roman soldiers who tortured him and killed him and put him on the cross for the Jewish leaders, like they thought, well, we're getting rid of this Jewish uprising. That'll, that'll solve it. We'll never hear about this guy again. Think about this. What if they knew that 2,000 years later, if you went to Rome, there would be crosses everywhere, and it wouldn't be because they were still crucifying people. It would be to remind people of this one Jewish carpenter that they crucified 2,200 years ago. Isn't that amazing? And that we, we call our dogs Nero and Caesar, and we call our sons and daughters Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, not sons and daughters. That would be really weird. But, but, I mean, it's amazing like how backwards things are. Like they thought they were wiping Jesus out, and they started this whole thing. So this is Easter. Easter means, from the story, what Jesus said is Easter means you don't have to get what you deserve. Here's the thing about those leaders. Literally, they're going, hey, you know what? Yeah, just finishing this story for you, Jesus. Yeah, that landowner is going to come back and slaughter those guys. But, but that's not what happened, is it? In fact, some of those very leaders who would go on to crucify Jesus we know from the book of Acts, became followers of Jesus. Saul, particularly, oh my goodness, became one of the most amazing Christian church planners. He wrote half of what we call the New Testament. He was one of those Pharisees and religious leaders. They had no idea, no idea. So they didn't get what they deserved. God didn't come back and slaughter everybody who killed Jesus. Instead, instead they were given mercy. No. Here's the other thing it means, is that God is in control even when things seem out of control. I mean, think about this, like they all thought they had it figured out. They all thought, you know, like the, the Romans thought they were putting down an uprising and they were starting this thing where someday their emperor would proclaim Jesus. I mean, they had no idea. And, and the religious leaders of, of Israel were thinking, we'll put this little cult down and it'll be back to business as usual. It was never back to business as usual. And Christianity became way larger than Judaism ever thought of. Be. I mean, it's just crazy. And even Jesus' followers, they thought, well, okay, Jesus can't possibly die because he's the Messiah. Then he died and they're so surprised and nobody he like thought he was coming back. When he comes back, they go, okay, well, cool. Things will get back to normal. Not at all. He goes back to heaven. And this like scared fisherman who denies he even knows Jesus ends up preaching a sermon and thousands of people become, it's nothing they expected. God had a plan. And here's the thing. See, I don't know where you're at in this story. Um, and I want the band to come back up here. Like some of you are going, I don't know, Don. I am. Uh, that doesn't really sound like me. You know, like, I'm a pretty good person, and, I, you know, if I get what I deserve, things are going to go all right for me. I, I've made a lot of good decisions. Um, you know, and, and so right now, you don't even feel the need for mercy for a Savior. And to be honest, right now, like, if you may be here, and you totally go, well, I, I pretty much think I am in control. Like, I don't need someone to be in control that I can't see because I'm in control. If that's you this morning, I'm going to tell you something that's going to shock you. I just want you to take what I've said about Jesus this morning and at least sort of put it in your mental junk drawer. Just all I'm asking you this morning is not believe what I said, not oh, do what I say. There's going to be some weird altar call. We're not going to ask you to do it. Just, just at least don't throw it away like that nut and bolt we found on our drawer. Like, you're going to regret it, I think. If you're here for a reason, like, just put it in your mental junk drawer and keep it because someday you might need it. In fact, I will tell you as someone who's lived almost 50 years on this earth, that someday you will need it. Someday you're going to come across the realization that you're not in control. Someday you're going to go, oh, I've done things that I hope, I pray that I'm not held accountable for. And that's when I want you to have this information. Now, the rest of you, I just wanted to remind you why it is such a big deal that we celebrate here on Easter. And... Some of you, some of you, literally, you know this. You've known this since you were a little kid, but it's still in your sort of mental brain junk drawer. And I want you to get it out and go, okay, okay, I'm broken, and this is the glue that fixes it. Okay, I'm way out of control. This is the thing I need. Jesus will do all of those things for you if you just get them out of there. You know it. Um, but I want to pray with you. And I thought, it's such a weird thing to go, wow, this psalm just... I think this is Easter, that the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And, and, and here's the interesting thing, and I didn't have time to get into it because I'm running a little short on time, but here's the funny thing. The rabbinical story that Jesus was quoting um, 
referred to to them would be that the capstone was the forgotten stone. And you notice it doesn't say capstone, it says cornerstone. The psalmist said cornerstone, so it's even weirder. Like, what it says is that somehow they rejected the stone because they thought it didn't fit into their building plan and then realized it was the foundational stone, which wouldn't work at all because you're like, wait a minute, we don't have... So it's, it's such a thought of Jesus, like we think of Jesus just showing up in the middle of the Bible. What he was reminding is he was there at the very beginning. This plan for salvation was actually the cornerstone. It should have been the first thing that went in. And everybody said, no, that can't possibly work. Oh, no, we know better. But yet Jesus was there from the very beginning. It's just an amazing thing. So the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. This is Easter. And it's wonderful to see. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Dear Father, thank you for sending your son. We're so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful that even if we were there, even if we were there, we wouldn't have known what you were up to. And God, just thank you that we even get the opportunity to celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. And that he didn't come back for revenge. He came for reconciliation. And that because of him, we can be forgiven. And because of him, we can know that, oh, even when we're so out of control, we can trust that you have a plan we can't even see. God, thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.